Go to work on yourself harder than you work on your job. If you work hard on your job, you can make a living. Then he said, if you work hard on yourself, you could make a fortune. So I worked hard on my job and made a living, but I learned, starting with those extra hours per week, learning these extra skills, I started working on myself. And here's a philosophical phrase everybody should take home. Here it is. Success is something you attract by becoming an attractive person. Success is not something you pursue. It's what you attract by becoming attractive. By becoming attractive to the marketplace. What would do that? Multiple skills? Multiple languages? So, now what else would help you to be attractive to the marketplace besides more than one skill and more than one languages? Could perhaps, like it did for me, multiply your income by two and then multiply it by three and then multiply your income by four and then by five and once you get there it's not that difficult to multiply it by ten because all you have to do is make sure you become more valuable and more valuable and more valuable you don't have to work on the economy because here's the first note each person's income is determined primarily by their philosophy not by the economy once i understood that then i said well i don't have to go to work on the economy and the answer was no you only have to go to work on yourself to make yourself more valuable so now here's five things i want to share with you and the first one is your personal philosophy what could get you more prepared and ready for cashing in on the opportunity of the 21st century and here's the first one personal philosophy your personal philosophy is like a guidance system that helps you make decisions what to do what not to do from the information you get and what you learn and what you know we decide maybe your philosophy would have been uh, five years ago never to attend seminars like this you just didn't go now five years later here you are something happened along the way to change your mindset saying hey for the money and the time if i just get one good idea and walk away it certainly is worth the money and the time so now that little amendment in your philosophy you now say i'm going to regularly go because it doesn't take but a few ideas to make a great difference in your income personal life social life and all the rest so now you know that's valuable a change of mind a change of idea so that's what personal philosophy is all about the more we learn the more we know the better we're able to make better decisions about two major things your philosophical guidance system does two things for your notes number one helps you to see the dangers on one side so you can avoid those but here's what else your guidance system does personal philosophy helps you to see the opportunities on the other side so that you can expand those maximize those and here's what that's called the game of life is to minimize the dangers and maximize the opportunities and the more we know and the more we learn the more experience we gather in sessions like this from the sermon on sunday morning to the books we read and all the rest helps us to keep continually adjusting our philosophical guidance system so that we minimize more dangers maximize more opportunities that's really the game of life i couldn't put it much more simply so number one we're affected by what we know now how do we know more things and learn more things that'll help us readjust our thinking so we can avoid the dangers maximize the opportunities here's number one learn from personal experience one way to learn to do something right is what first do it wrong right mess up and then you say wow that was costly I'm never gonna do that again so one way to learn to do it right first do it wrong sometimes a negative experience turns out finally to be positive they say if you survive your first heart attack you may now live to be a very old person why is that well that first heart attack if you survived it is called a wake-up call 
and maybe the doctor said, one more of these and your history. And you said, wow. And you make it for the health food store. And you start reading every book you can find on good nutrition, how to avoid another one of these heart attacks. And you start jogging and start walking and doing all of the stuff. And this total change of lifestyle could now save your life and cause you to live to be a very old person. Here's what my mentor said that some of the best advice I ever got. He said, Mr. Rohn, if you will change, everything will change for you. If you'll start making personal changes, your income will change, your health will change, your future will change, everything will change if you're willing to start making the changes. So sometimes a negative experience now causes us to really make a sudden shift in our philosophical guidance system that says, hey, I'm never going to let this happen to me again. Fantastic. Now here's the next way to learn, and that is to learn from other people's experiences, whether they are negative or positive. It's too bad failures don't give seminars like this. Wouldn't that be good information? Now we don't want to pay them so they don't lecture, so. But their information would be valuable. If you know a guy that's messed up his life for 40 years, you have to say, John, would you spend a day with me? And I will bring my notebook and take good notes. A good looking guy like you, beautiful family, every reason to do well, threw it all away. Teach me how for the last 40 years you messed it all up. And he tells you, and you take good notes. Learning from the negative side of someone's experience. If somebody tells me these eggs are rotten, I'm not going to make an omelet and try it, right? I'm just going to take their advice and their know-how. So learn number one from your own experiences and learn number two from other people's experiences. And my mentor taught me to always keep a journal. Here's what he said, don't trust your memory. If you want to live a dynamic life, multiplying your income, multiplying your future, be a good student. If a good idea comes your way, write it down, then ponder it, then perhaps go do it. Okay. Now, your philosophy comes from what you learn, comes from what you know, comes from other people's experiences. Three ways now to learn from other people. Here's number one, learn from what you see. One of the great watchwords of these early years of the 21st century, pay attention. If you just watch, you can pick up clues. Success leaves clues. And if you'll be a better observer of the winners and the losers, those that are doing well and those that are falling behind, and just take mental notes and good notes and say, I'm going to adjust to what I'm doing based on what I see. Here's number two. We learn so much from other people based on what we hear. Here's good advice on that. Be a selective listener. Listen to voices of value that have experience, ideas, reputation, something valuable to share. Now here's number three, read all the books. Now there's millions of books, so you can't read all the books, but make this note, read all the books you need to read to make you as wealthy as you want to be, as healthy as you want to be, as prosperous, as productive, as unique a human being as you want to be. Read all of those books. Don't leave those books go unread. My mentor got me started on my library when I was 25. I got one of the best. If you saw my library, you would be impressed. I haven't read everything in it, but I feel smarter just walking in it, right? My library. I was smart enough to buy it all. Now I got to be smart enough to read it all. Now jot this down. When you do read, you have to sort through what you read and decide which is valuable to try. That's part of the process of learning. Gathering information and sorting through it. One, the information that would apply to you and what you think would be valuable based on your current philosophical opinion. So read all the books. Our lives are greatly affected by what we learn and what we know. For every disciplined effort, a multiple reward. For every disciplined effort, a multiple reward. What a concept. 
If you render unique service, your reward will be multiplied. If you're fair and honest and patient with others, your reward will be multiplied. If you give more than you expect to receive, your reward is more than you expect. But remember, the key word here, as you might well imagine, is discipline. Everything of value requires care and attention. Everything of value requires discipline. Children require discipline. They must have a structure built for them. They must have boundaries to work within so they feel secure and comfortable to explore and grow. They must learn to recognize what's right and what's wrong, what's acceptable behavior, what's not acceptable. Children require unwavering discipline, consistent discipline, or they'll be confused as to how they're supposed to behave. Likewise, our thoughts require discipline. We must set up our inner boundaries, our codes of conduct, or our thoughts will be confused. And with confused thoughts, we'll end up being confused, hopelessly lost in the maze of life. And confused thoughts produce confused results. Look around you at this very moment in time. What might you be doing that needs attention? Perhaps you're listening to this program as you drive along in traffic, blowing your horn at someone ahead of you who isn't driving at the speed you'd like to. Perhaps you're listening alone because you've had a disagreement with someone you love or someone who loves you, and your anger won't allow you to speak to that person. Wouldn't this be an ideal time to examine your need for a new discipline? Perhaps you're on the brink of giving up or starting over or starting out and the only missing ingredient to your incredible success story in the future is a new and self-imposed discipline that will make you stay longer and try harder and work more intensely than you ever thought you possibly could. The most valuable form of discipline is the one that you impose on yourself. Don't wait for things to deteriorate so drastically that someone else must impose discipline into your life. Wouldn't that be tragic? How could you possibly explain the fact that someone else thought more of you than you thought of yourself? That they forced you to get up early and get out into the marketplace when you would have been content to let success go to someone else who cared more about themselves. Your life, my life, the life of each one of us is going to serve as either a warning or an example. A warning of the consequences of neglect, self-pity, lack of direction and ambition, or an example of talent put to use. Can too much discipline be a bad thing? Can you possibly be too disciplined? Too much of anything is a bad thing. Life without balance results in an unbalanced life. Walking around the block every day is good. Walking or running six hours a day is bad. It's obsessive. Unless, of course, you make your living as a marathon runner. Then you're doing your job. Eating an apple a day is good. Eating only apples is bad. You won't get all the protein and vitamins and nutrients your body needs. Working hard, burning the midnight oil, doing it until is good. Working nonstop, never taking a vacation, never having any fun, never spending quality time with the people you love, working, working, working day after day, month after month, never taking a break year after year, is bad. If you've got your nose to the grindstone all the time, how are you ever going to spot new opportunities, consider new ideas? It doesn't work that way. You've got to stop and ponder where you've been and where you're going. You've got to reflect so you know if you're even on the right track. Everyone has heard the story of Willie Lohman in the play Death of a Salesman. Willie was a workaholic. He typified the old-fashioned concept of success. After all, if you're always working, you must be successful. No, it doesn't work that way. For workaholics, there's never enough work. They can work 10, 12, 14 hours a day, take two jobs, work them back to back. The only satisfaction is fighting off sleep, denying life's pleasures, getting more tasks done. Some people are impressed with this type of behavior. 
But just because a workaholic spends too much time working, that doesn't mean he or she ends up with the most money. These people are generally more task-oriented than results-oriented. They're busy being busy, not busy being productive. Workaholics generally end up alienating their families, losing their health, facing a crisis of values. Now, wouldn't you prefer a life of productivity rather than a life of tasks? Of course. When you schedule your time and take advantage of your time, you can work smarter instead of working longer. And you'll probably end up getting more done than the workaholic and still have time for other things in life. Enlightened self-interest says, I will look for new ways to work smarter by focusing on doing more per hour instead of doing more hours. It says I will run my day so my day doesn't run me. Enlightened self-interest also says that a life worth living comes from a life of balance and moderation. Too much of anything, even good things, will sooner or later throw you off track. Now, here's the key technique that you can use in your life to help keep you on the right track. This technique is called visual chain thinking. Ambitious people don't see each step toward their goals as a singular step each discipline as a singular discipline, each project as a singular project, each sale as a singular sale. With everything they do and with every discipline they adhere to, they see it all as part of a chain, a link in the chain of events and actions that will lead them to their final destination. Every action and every discipline today is a link in the chain. Every action and every discipline tomorrow is a link. Every action and every discipline in the future is a link. When you can see that every link in the chain will eventually lead you to the things you want most out of life, to the person you want to become, then you won't grow discouraged or fearful or impatient with today. When you can see where you're going through visual chain thinking, even on the toughest days, You'll keep building your ambition by knowing where you're going, not just where you are today. Part of this visual chain thinking is built when you decide on your direction, when you can see where you're going to end up before you get there. When you can see California while staring at the east side of a 14,000 foot mountain. And building your visual chain of thought begins when you have well-defined plans for your career your family activities, your investments, and your health. Your plans and goals are your visual chain, knowing where you're going before you get there. Develop a plan, a game plan. It's ironic how we all understand the importance of mapping out a strategy for a football game or a basketball game. Not one professional team in the world begins a game without a complete strategy. But few of us, Take the time to map out a strategy for our lives, a game plan. But it's important. Here's the first rule for your game plan of life. Don't start your day until you have it finished. Don't begin your activities of the day until you know exactly what you plan to accomplish. Don't start your day until you have it planned and do this every day. I know all this writing takes time and a disciplined effort. But remember that value is the fruitful result of discipline, not hope. Once you've mastered the art of planning your day, you're ready for the next level. Don't start your week until you have it finished. Don't begin your activities of the week until you know exactly what you plan to accomplish. Don't start your week until you have it planned. Just imagine what life would be like if you took time out of every Sunday to plan your week. Come Friday, you won't be saying, boy, did this week fly by. Where did it go? What did I do? No, if you plan your week before you start it, you'll know exactly what you want to do, what you want to accomplish, what you need to work on. If you learn to plan your days as part of your overall game plan for the week, the parts will fit much better. Your days will be better, more effective. You'll be working smarter, not harder. 
And when you've learned to plan your week, guess what? You've got to plan your month. Don't start your month until it's finished. By developing a game plan for your days, your weeks, your months, by developing and following your game plan, your days and weeks and months all become part of a bigger plan, a bigger design, a long-term view of your life, a visual chain. You'll start gaining a greater perspective of it all because you are planning. It takes great discipline on your part, but it will soon lead to a new habit, a habit of mastering your time, a habit of discipline that will lead you to the good life. First of all, let's define worry. There are many ways we could describe it. Worry is fear painting pictures in your mind. And if you watch that mental movie too long, you get a false picture of how things really are. Worry is a mental broadcasting station, and more often than not, it is false or at least distorted propaganda. Worry has that sneaky way of stopping short of giving you all the facts. Worry is often the trickery of mentally filtered facts on the negative side and the bold declaration that these are all the facts. Worry has the mental audacity to suggest that the elevator only runs one way, down. Many times worry is a five-alarm bell for a wastebasket fire. And worry is a depletion of constructive emotion. It's wasted mental energy. It's like letting the starter run the battery down when the car won't start. And worry is most often a lack of all the facts. A lack of full understanding, a lack of total information, and an unpreparedness of ability, knowledge, talent, courage, faith, and all the other virtues. That should give us a better definition of worry, and remember, left unchecked, it can become like a mad dog loose in the house, and the sorrow and pain and regret is too large a price to pay not to do something about it, and to do it now. You see, if you contemplated the total sum of human suffering long enough, it would drive you mad. You must understand how life is, Human suffering, man's inhumanity to man, war, disease, poverty. But it must be in what I call its rightful ratio of your mental and emotional time. So much for what worry is. The next question is, what can I do about it? What is the first step? My best advice on this is to first recognize worry for what it is. Admit what it does, and then decide you now want to be free. It first starts with decision on your part. And may I add, well, you should decide. Why let worry continue to take money out of your pocket and bank account? Why let worry any longer keep you from becoming all you can be? Why let it rob you of better friendships, better business, better profits, better results, better communication, better family relations? Why impose your worry on others any longer? It's a burden you can get rid of and a monkey you can get off your back. Why not be rid of those sinking, nagging feelings that all is not going to be well, that you can't do it, that it won't work out for the best? Worry is undue concern that takes up too much of your mental and emotional time. Now we must all be concerned. Hey, life is no joke except to the jokers. Life and how to live it is a serious matter. It is risky, full of peril, and there are constant threats to the good we want and to the pursuit of happiness. However, it is undue concern, or concern that takes up too much mental time that begins the harm. It's like a family planning a wonderful trip. While they certainly should be concerned about the condition of the car, the tires, and making sure they pick the proper route, it would be foolish to allow themselves to be completely turned negative with the thought that they might crash and kill the entire family. If that were the case, even if they went, the entire trip would be turned into one nightmare of fear with the specter of chaos looming around every curve rather than enjoying the wonderful trip they had planned for themselves and their family. 
A lot of people do that with their entire life. So, start to make these declarations. And if you mean it, they will start you on your way to confidence and adventure free of the worry habit. Say first, I've had it with worry. I'm tired of being beaten down and hassled with all those negative mental pictures. I refuse to be tricked by false facts. I'm really not that weak. Never again do I want those sick feelings inside, those mental false alarms. I'm tired of the drain on my resources. I'm tired of the embarrassment of the lack of confidence. I don't want people, especially my family, to see me in this state anymore. I've got more to offer. I refuse to let my life be short-circuited any longer by letting my mind run wild with a distorted view of the facts, whether I bring it up or if it comes from someone else. Prove it to yourself. Think back over all the things that you worried about, all the fantastic catastrophic events that your well-meaning advisors had told you were going to happen. Be pleased that none of them ever happened to you or else you would not be alive today. 90% of the things you worry about never happen anyway. All of us have had these well-meaning advisors who want to appear larger in the eyes of those they wish to advise and who immediately rear back and describe every single bad option they can think of that might possibly happen. By the time they have finished, the one who has come for some confidence and some help wonders why he even bothers to live anymore. And the fact is, those things are never really going to happen anyway. Bring to question now what your mind tells you or what others tell you and pledge not to go for false alarms. I've had it is a good beginning. This first step will start you arguing with your worry thoughts. Soon you will start to examine your fears and worries to see if they are valid and you won't let your mind play those mental tricks any longer. It is possible to destroy any emotion you have including worry and fear by a very simple process and that is analyze it to death. Drag it out on the table and look at it. Weigh it against all of your past experiences. Make sure this one can stand against all the past facts you have. You will now start to use worry instead of letting worry use you. It's a beginning, being in control instead of out of control. You will now let concern and the first signs of worry prompt you to learn, ask questions, and look at all sides in order to evaluate true, positive, constructive action. Now you can say, I will let fear advise me of the facts, but I won't let fear tell me these are all the facts. Nor will I let fear determine my reaction to the facts. I will gladly take up the war of faith over doubt, reason over fear, and positive expectation over worry. So talk to yourself right now into a change of attitude. Be persuasive. Go all out. Show yourself the hell if you don't and the good life of answers and progress if you do. Say to yourself, what a fantastic feeling it must be to stop the panic drain on my mental energy, emotion, and physical strength. Imagine putting all that saved energy and emotion and strength into my action plans for the good life. Hey, accept the challenge. Believe your beliefs. Doubt your doubts. Stay on the campaign to give worry a bad time. Like being your own conscientious judge, say, I've had it with the presentation of a one-sided story. I sustain the objection that worry has failed to bring out all the facts. I despise these mental courtroom maneuvers that try to belittle my client, me, I demand the whole truth, and if worry will not be silent, I may cite him for contempt of the court of reason. Call up that scene often when worry wants to hassle you with the same old tricks and the same old results. It will work every time.
Okay, let's move on to some really positive steps. If you can survive all that has happened to you up to this moment in your life, in spite of doing and thinking many of the wrong things, imagine how you can succeed by now starting to do some of the right things. First, the best answer to worry is confidence, and confidence starts first with awareness. Here is one of the most important lessons in life to learn. Life and business is like the changing seasons, and the real challenge of life is to learn how to handle the winter and take advantage of the spring. In short, that's it. You see, winter always comes, but so does the spring. Night follows day, but also day follows night. Sure, the tide goes out, but it always comes in. Opportunity follows difficulty as surely as difficulty follows opportunity. I have written and recorded much on how to take advantage of the spring, how to cash in on life's opportunities, work hard all summer, learn more ways to plant and protect what you invest, and to reap in the fall without complaint knowing it's your harvest and you've reaped what you've sown. For this subject, however, let's talk about how to handle the winters, those times when worry like winter takes its heavy toll. So, we tell it like it is. Winter always comes. So does the night. Some happenings in our life will always be a cause for concern. And sometimes concern turns to worry, and worry turns to fear. But remember, that is to be expected. Each day, each event, each season brings both expected and unexpected challenges that we must think about and make decisions on. Life is like a stream that flows continuously. The better we understand that, the better chance we have to produce good results out of all of our challenges. May I suggest something to you? I have a friend who is an avid skier. You know something? He can only ski in the wintertime. You can only hunt the elk when the snow falls in the high mountains and drives them down. That's called wintertime. You see, it's all right if it's twelve below. Just be prepared for the winter. And here is a good thought. A full, well-developed -devel human being will find a way to take advantage of the winter, not just handle it. The big challenge is to make something out of each opportunity. Now, if winters are always going to occur in our life, shouldn't we benefit from them too? Come the next winter, you could be on the inside looking out, seated by a warm fire, the company of a good friend, and those unique feelings of security in spite of the circumstances or the season. Begin to know now that the night will pass, and as you learn to grow and progress, you will better understand how to handle every night and better live every day. Here's some of the best advice I have on worry. First, don't be afraid to face the facts of life. It is not negative to understand that the winters always come. Don't be faked out. Don't clip the word impossible out of the dictionary. Sure, the Bible says all things are possible but I don't really understand all that means. My daughters asked me, have you ever tried putting toothpaste back in the tube? Don't say I don't want to hear the problem. I don't want to see the difficulty. Don't show me the weeds. Don't say anything negative. Only see the positive. That's foolish. There is a thin line between positive thinking and kidding yourself. And remember, there's also a thin line between faith and folly. Here is the key. Humans have the unique ability to see it as it is, and they also have the ability to see it better than it is. One is called fact, the other is called faith. Faith you develop, facts you acquire. The facts you acquire are essential. It's like belief. You constantly must find facts to support your belief. Faith says, I will move mountains. It doesn't say, 
I will move mountains if someone gives me a bulldozer. I'll move a mountain if they will build me a road up there. If the weather's nice. If they give me a shovel. Faith just says, I will move mountains. Faith doesn't ask for a result to prove its existence. Faith is because it is. And remember, people die for faith. And some people give up everything they own, their life, for faith. Many years ago, over in Vietnam, a Buddhist monk did a very clever thing. He did the ultimate in political dissent. He burned himself to death. That toppled the government. That was faith. Totality begets totality. Here is a good prayer. Help me to see it as it is and help me to see it better than it is, and then inspire me to act. Facts and faith and action, what a combination for personal progress. And action puts fear to flight. An Old Testament phrase says, Watch the ants, you sluggard, consider their ways and be wise. Not a bad suggestion. The study of ants what do they do in the summer to prepare for the winter? That's a lesson in life and survival. Happiness, wealth, peace, security, success, safety, friendship, reward, results, and all human achievement comes from a growing ability to understand and handle the changing seasons. And so we come right back to the theme of our entire enterprise, self-development. Learn to work harder on yourself than anything else. The key to all success in economics or mental health is self-development. It will all change for the better when you change for the better. It's what you become that really counts. And you are the only variable. So a good statement is, you can't be all positive. You can't be all confident. You can't be all faith. But confidence and faith and courage and inspiration can dominate worry and fear. Physical and emotional forces are always at work, and something will win and conquer. Make sure you give yourself the best chance to get mental and emotional domination over all of your challenges. And here is one of the master keys to the good life. Developing the intelligence and accepting the challenge of putting all of your emotional experience into their rightful ratio. Beginning this progress can bring about the most dramatic changes. You see, disappointment is like winter. It always comes. It is foolish to say, don't be disappointed. But you must learn to discipline your disappointment. If it dominates 51% of your time, you're in trouble. Continued heavy disappointment is like 12 months of winter, and 12 months of winter leaves very little alive. Use the guidelines of seasons to adjust to all the meaningful things that happen to you. So concern, fear, and disappointment, like many human emotions, serve a useful purpose as long as they are kept in their rightful ratio. Left unattended, the weeds take over. Disappointment rules, worry breaks loose, fear gets the upper hand, and doubt moves in. But managed, worked, given human action with will and knowledge and purpose, and gardens overcome weeds, faith overcomes doubt, and confidence pushes worry into a small place. The second major key to mastering worry is to respond. Build up inside of you that heavy desire to be free, to get on with building your life and lifestyle. Too much is waiting to delay. Take a new look at your opportunities. Figure out new ways to seize them immediately and make them work for you. And here is a key. Bring a new dedication that you will master yourself with enough discipline to be more than qualified to do the present job and prepare yourself for the next move up. Expose yourself to every stimulation possible that will put all this in perspective. 
Now let's move on to a very important point, and that is the best answer to worry is confidence. First, self-confidence. I can better handle next winter. I have a strong shelter. It is stocked with supplies. I now know how to take advantage of the spring. I'm going to plant better crops and bigger crops. I can last through the summer. I won't quit this time. I'll study weeds and how to get rid of them. I'll be less frightened of the changing weather and the quick storms. In the fall, I will exercise more care and reap what I have without complaint and blame nothing for the amount of my harvest. I'll learn to save a fair portion so that I can survive the bad seasons when out of control the hailstorm comes and it all goes wrong. Now we must consider this. The most fatal deterrent to self-confidence is guilt. Not doing all you know how to do to the full extent of your present ability weakens the foundation for confidence. The biggest part of worry comes from the lack of this personal confidence. And lack of confidence comes from two major things. First, no goals or plans. And second, no daily discipline to achieve. The inaction to cure or handle small tasks is what starts the guilt process. And that always tends to make you look at what's wrong and expect the worst. So listen to the voices of creative experience. Let nature, experience, wisdom, books, everything speak to you and teach you. Remember, both opportunity and challenge await action. Everything yields to diligence. Here's the next one. Look around. You might have overlooked some people that need to be recognized. You might have overlooked some talent that you could be using to help in the training and conduct meetings. Don't miss some of the gifts that are close by you. Look around and say, who's doing a good job that maybe I've missed this last year? Look around and see if there aren't some people who need to be lifted up, who need your inspiration, who need your presence, who need your time. Here's the next one. Look down to the work. Look down to the soil that's ready for the seeds of opportunity that you will share by your voice and your invitation and your language and your meetings, your presentation. Look down to the work that your hands can work miracles. Look down to the task and see if there aren't some things you might have missed this past year you can pick up on this year and work miracles for yourself, for your future, for your organization. Here's the next one. It's a word of caution. Look out for the enemy that's on the outside as well as the enemy that's on the inside. Look out for your own thoughts that might deceive you, saying you're too short, you're too tall, you're too old, you've never done it before. What makes you think you can do it now? Look out for the temptation. I've told the story and it bears repeating, an ancient story that said there were two nice people. This is not a story of one bad person and one good person. The storyteller says this is a story of two nice people, however, and I want you to underline the word however, because that's the drama of life. However, one built his house on the rock and the other built his house on the sand. And sure enough, the storms came as they always do, and the one that built his house on the rock was saved. The one that built his house on the sand was lost. Here's what it means. Nice people can make careless decisions. Nice people can make foolish decisions. None of us are above temptation. That's why the great prayer says, lead us around temptation. Hopefully deliver us from the evil. Tempted to cross the line. A customer shows up across the street from where you live. 
And it's so easy to say, rather than being taken care of by someone who lives so far away, I can take care of you because I live just across the street. Don't listen to the tempter. Stay on track. Build on the rock. Look out for your own mind that would tell you your dreams can't come true. Look out for your own thoughts that would tell you that it's not going to work that well for you. Look out for that. Here's the next one. Look inside. Some of you have just started to develop your talents and your skills and your abilities. Some of you have done enough to reach this level, to reach these tables, to be in this room. But I promise you, if you go home and take another look inside, here's the question to ask. What else could I develop? of my mind and my spirit and my talents and my ability that would make me more valuable to myself, to my family, to my organization. What else could I do? How far could I reach inside for something I haven't found yet? Here's the next one. Look up to the God that made us all, to a higher power that's still within reach. Draw on that spiritual part of human existence and human life, it'll work miracles. Once in a while I get a letter, guess what it says? Dear Mr. Rohn, while you travel the world, please remember, we pray for you. I thought, wow, that's what I felt at 39,000 feet <laughs> when I was a little weary and tired. Somebody in South Africa was saying a prayer for Jim Rohn. All of that unseen miracle stuff that we all touch at times in our lives. I'm asking you to look up and draw on that experience, that comfort, that uniqueness that makes us who we are. There's nothing you can do about the past, but you can do a great deal about your future. You don't have to be the same person you were yesterday. You can make changes in your life, absolutely startling changes in a fairly short period of time. You can make changes you can't even conceive of now. If you give yourself a chance, your abilities will grow. You have untapped talents and potential that you haven't even reached for yet. And as time goes on, you'll be able to reach deeper and deeper. The first thing you'll know, you'll be able to do things you never thought you could do. You'll be able to handle things you never thought you could handle. You'll have ideas that you've never had before. All of this is sparked by the goal setting process. When you know what you want and you want it badly enough, the answers will come to you. I can't tell you why it works. All I know is it works. Give yourself a chance to become all you can become and to accomplish all you can accomplish. Let me give you a Bible philosophy that teaches how to get whatever you want. Here's what it says, ask. That's it, ask. Of all the important skills to learn in life, be sure to include the skill of asking. What does ask mean? Ask means, what do you want? And the complete formula is staggering. It says ask and you will receive. Hey, we ought to look into that. The man says, yes, but you work where I work, but the time you struggle home, it's late. You've got to get a bite to eat, watch a little TV and get to bed. You can't sit up half the night and ask, ask, ask. And this guy is behind on his bills. He's a good worker, hard worker, sincere. But you've got to do better than work hard and be sincere all of your life. You'll wind up broke and embarrassed. You've got to be better than a good worker. You've got to be a good asker. Let me give you some key points on this asking and receiving, setting goals, asking of life. Here's part of the philosophy that helped me to change. First, asking starts the receiving process. Asking is like pushing a button and all this machinery starts working, mental and emotional machinery. I don't even know how it works, but I do know it works. There are a lot of things you don't need to know how they work. Just work them. Some people are always studying the roots. Others are picking the fruit. It all depends on what end of it you want in on. So asking is the beginning of receiving. Second, 
Receiving is not the problem. You don't have to work on receiving. It's automatic. So if receiving is not the problem, what is the problem? It's failing to ask. The man says, I see it now. I got up every day this year and hit it hard. But nowhere in my house is there a list of what I want from my life. Can you see? Good worker, poor asker. Third, receiving is like the ocean. There's plenty, especially in this country. It's like an ocean here. Here, success is not in short supply. It isn't rationed so that when you step up to the window, it's all gone. No, no. Well, if that's true, what is the problem? Well, the problem is some people go to the ocean with a teaspoon. Have you got the picture? A teaspoon. What I suggest you do in view of the size of the ocean is trade your teaspoon for at least a bucket. And you will look better at the ocean with a bucket. Kids won't make fun of you. Now, here's something else to remember about asking. There are two ways to ask. One is ask with intelligence. It didn't say ask intelligently, but I'm sure it meant that. Don't mumble. You won't get anything by mumbling. Be clear, be specific. Intelligent asking means how high, how long, how much, when, what size, what model, what color. Describe what you want. Define it. Remember, well-defined goals are like magnets. The better you define them, the stronger they pull. And give your goals purpose. Answer both questions. What do I want? That's the object. And the second question, what for? That's purpose. Purpose is stronger than object. What you want is powerful and it will pull. But what you want it for is more powerful. Here's the second way to ask. Ask with faith. Faith is the childish part. It means believe you can get what you want like a child, not an adult. Many adults are too skeptical. They've lost that wonderful childlike faith and trust. Don't let that happen to you. Believe in, have faith in yourself and your goals and get excited like a child. Childlike enthusiasm, nothing can beat it. Kids think they can do anything. How exciting. They hate to go to bed at night and can't wait to get up in the morning. Develop that kind of enthusiasm toward your life and your goals and be curious like a child. Kids can ask a thousand questions. Just when you think they're finished, they come up with a thousand more. They'll drive you to the brink, but it's really a virtue. Have plenty of curiosity. Ask questions. That's how you learn.